our, our roll call, if that's okay. Hi, everybody. Roll call, Neil Lorne. Here. Pedros. Here. Jacques Livingston. Here. Courtney Michelle. Here. Sandra Stewart. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. All good. All right. So, uh, do we have a motion to approve uh, the meeting minutes from? I guess that would be the the March meeting. I make a motion that we approve the minutes. All right. Second. David has a offers a motion there, and uh, Courtney Michelle offers a second. And uh, any comment on the content of the minutes? All right, hearing none, all in favor of uh, approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the meeting minutes are approved. All right, Tyler and Phil, communication from staff. Uh, the court is yours. Sure. So thank you all for coming here tonight together in this new virtual environment. It's been a change of life for everyone. I think I don't think we all figured, learned or thought we would adapt like this, but um, this is quickly becoming the norm. I appreciate all of you um, taking the time to figure out the, and download the WebEx and being patient with us as we work through this. Um, you know, really, it's it's th thanks to Jane and Stacy for getting this set up. They put a lot of work on the back end and getting all this going. And I think one of the things that we've learned as an organization is it's kind of shifting duties of a lot of staff. And that's where I would say Jane and Stacy have both stepped up really big to to fill a role and kind of the running the meeting running the meeting portion. Th thanks to them. And Jane's on the call here. Do you have anything you wanted to say in terms of um, process? To help the meeting minutes smoothly. Raise, raise your hand, talk one at a time. Anything you want to cover on that? Sorry to put you on the spot, but I want to give you that opportunity. No, no, it's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think just as we, we move through the meeting, it's great if we could um, all mute ourselves during the meeting so we don't hear a lot of background noise. Um, what I've seen at most meetings is the best way to do it is people to raise their hand when they want to speak. Um, Neil is the chair. You'll just watch and kind of see whose hands are up. Um, other than that, I think that just makes the um, will make the meeting run a little bit smoother for everyone. I'm back here on the back end recording the meeting, so we'll, this meeting will end up on YouTube um, in the next couple days. So. Um, we can go back and watch ourselves again and learn from it. But thank you all for participating. And if you need anything, I'm back here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, some help, other housekeeping stuff. So Melanie, her term ended in June. She decided that she did not want to to apply to be on TAB again. And she decided that she was looking to pursue other opportunities. I understand council is looking to make board appointments in July. So, uh, Joan, I believe that's coming up pretty soon from, from you guys. So we'll have hopefully two new board members at that time. Um, over the last couple of months, we've really made an effort to try and just give information. Like I mentioned, it's putting um, running these meetings as kind of a new dynamic for staff. And so we're really trying to take I'm trying I've been trying to share all the information a lot of the information we would provide at TAB meetings as an email update. So hopefully those have been valuable for, for this group. And if you have any questions about any of the stuff that we've sent out, I'm happy to hear any feedback you have on that or anything you'd like to see come back to you guys in any further detail, please let me know and we can, and we can do that. Um, following up on a couple items from last month's meeting, we had Buzz Feldman came public invited to be heard. The two questions that I had, written down from him. One, Ken Pratt and Sherman, he'd asked a question about a traffic signal at that intersection. It's a very busy intersection there. Um, one of the things that we're looking at, there's a, one of our CIP projects is Ken Pratt widening that would go from Nelson to um, South Pratt Parkway to continue that piece of 
widening we did uh, five or so years ago. As part of that, what we're looking at wouldn't be a signal. It would be more along the lines of restricting some of the movements at that intersection. Some of the issues with the signal at that location is the spacing is, is not very good for progression along there. And CDOT initially has not been super excited about that location. It's also really close to the railroad tracks. So when we look at how we're stacking traffic through that area, we definitely have to be cognizant of trying to not stack cars on the track. So that's one of the big factors that we're looking at in terms of if or how that could be signalized. So the, the reality is probably access movement restrictions would be the, the resolution there. It would solve the crash problem. It doesn't necessarily make it easier to get out of there. The other comment that Buzz had left was westbound Clover Basin approaching Fordham. There's a lane drop sign. And there was some question about is it right and it can be sort of confusing. So the sign, the sign is correct and I can understand how it would be con confusing. And one of the things that we're going to do in addition to the sign is add some additional pavement markings, the, the lane drop pavement markings. I'm sure you've probably seen them driving around before. They're kind of the, the angled arrows on the pavement. So we'll add those to hopefully try and resolve that a little bit more. So two things that we're going to do there. Um, a handful of other things to talk about. Phil, did you have a couple things you want to chat about too? Sure. Um... Maybe I'll steal some of, hate to steal Tyler's thunder, but it's been kind of exciting project for all of us um, at the city and within city council. And I think TAB as well as the main street closures closure or the main street lane closures that you've seen out there. So we do have some preliminary data, which has been kind of exciting that it's not Carmageddon as we say, it's, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're actually seeing relatively minor uh, delays. Typically on a kind of a regular time of the day, we're seeing about maybe 10 seconds of delay for people trying to get through that section of Main Street. Um, during the AM peak going southbound, and somebody has a, a lot of feedback coming back. I'm not sure, Tyler, if that's your volume may be too high, but um, thanks. Um, anyway, so we're starting to see that the the volume going southbound is probably an extra 20 seconds, maybe uh, 25 seconds, maybe going southbound in the mornings. And then in the afternoon, that is where we're seeing some backups and we've had some issues, but they're not been very major. They're about, we're seeing about a minute, a minute and 10 second delay through that whole intersection. You know, compared to what we used to, what it used to take us to go th through that section of Main Street uh, from third, basically second up to sixth, it's taking us an extra minute um, maybe an extra 70 seconds to get through that section of Main Street. So really, we're not seeing these 15-minute delays that people were kind of were kind of worried about. So that's been exciting. And again, I sorry Tyler if that kind of took away from what you were saying, but um, that's right. I was I was trying to find my email here with the or my list of topics to cover. So apologize, but yeah. So yeah, we're I think that was the next one. We're measuring the travel times between first and ninth. So it's a little bit further than I think the extents you were saying. So the little bit longer length, when we we're looking at the travel times over that, we're able to measure week over week and day over day increases in that. We're also measuring volumes. We did a lot of traffic data collection on Main Street, Kaufman, um, Kimbark, Terry, and Emory to try and really see how that traffic is going to move around. It, where is it going? If it's not on Main Street, where is it going? And, and to be able to quantify that and really have a good picture of what happened while we closed these lanes. So. Yeah, fun. It's an interesting project to see how, how it works and how, how the public reacts to it and where they go and, and impacts to the system. Looks like yes. had a question. So Jacques had a question there yeah. and then uh, David after that. Okay. So you, you kind of took my question there, Tyler, um, about wondering where the traffic is going then. Um, but I was wondering, are you also looking all the way over to, say, Hoover to see if maybe we're seeing an increase during uh, rush hour times? So we'll, we'll look at Hoover as well for volumes. We have a couple intersections where we have uh, counters, uh, detectors in the ground that we can use as counters and we can get a, a daily count on that. I think I am set up to where I can do travel times there. I'll double check on that as well. If we can see a difference, measure a difference in travel time on that. 
Um, we're looking at all those F factors. How about, uh, have you had any feedback from the uh, businesses along third that have the extended frontage? So I think initially there's a handful of businesses that are pretty excited about it. There are some that have moved out there. They're doing seating areas. I've seen some bike racks out in the space. Um, I think there's still opportunity for a lot more to come out. We've been working, Phil and I have been working with Kimberly at LDDA to try and figure out how to better use that space or communicate to the, to the businesses that that's available to them. I would say there's also a handful of folks that are not really excited about this closure yet. And so we're certainly working with those folks to try to figure out what we can do to make this a little less painful for them if you know there's perceived pain and then there's you know real financial pain so we need to kind of measure out which is which here and what and, and what's happening so we're, we're working with folks and i think a lot of that has to do maybe with the perception that on-street parking is really kind of the be all end all um you know that's really that front door service is really critical so council member uh joan peck uh, hi, Phil, have you had any, or uh, Tyler, have you had any feedback from the cyclists yet? Uh, is it working for them as well as for the motorists? Well, I think I'll take this one, if you don't mind, Tyler, and just kind of talk about, um, you know, the, the cyclists have enjoyed getting into this closure area, but I don't think they're seeing the benefit of really being able to travel very quickly. I think the alleys are still providing that that function when they're fully open. And I think we're having some issues with maybe um, like some of the alleys close on the weekends so that there's seating out there as well. But there's plenty of space for bicycles still. So we're working through those issues as well. But I think once the bicyclists get to Main Street, they've kind of reached their destination and to bicycle on Main Street is more of a novelty than it is a practical, practical way of getting around. So <laughs> it's been fun for people to kind of bike in those areas, but. With the liquor laws the way they are too, and the alcohol sales, um, there has to be a certain way to fence off the seating areas, and that's good to keep bicyclists out of there. But it also inhibits people from moving through there as as quickly, I think, as they'd like. So we're working on that as well. Thank you. That that's perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Just along the lines of, of uh, comments uh, and communication from staff, since this is the first meeting we've had in quite some time, can you just comment on, from a COVID perspective, uh, pandemic perspective, and budget perspective, uh, to what extent are you seeing significant impacts to the projects that we've talked about here at the Transportation Advisory Board meeting, or, or are you finding that that's more impacts for next year's budget? I should probably turn that over to Jim for if Jim has a chance to answer that question. All right. Thanks, Phil. Appreciate that one. Uh, so <laughs> in regards to the budget, um, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, um, as it kind of swept through or came into Longmont and the closures of restaurants uh, and uh, impacts to bars, um, it kind of the, the biggest hit that uh, that we see in, in public works and natural resources is the impacts to the street fund, which is funded through the sales and use tax. Um, it also hits the general fund, um, hits uh, public safety. Um, as it was unfolding, um, the city took a kind of a... Um, bit of a, a conservative stance. We, we held off on um, any uh, position shifts. Uh, we pretty much for the street fund cut back a lot of our capital for this year um, until we saw what, um, how over time, how it impacted it. Uh, we had some projections of the downturn, downturn in April and May um, as Jim Golden, um, has been tracking the budgets. It's turned out that uh, has not been as bad as as we thought it was going to be. Um, so um, we're still waiting for what we're looking at currently is May num numbers for May 
it, they come about a month late. Um, but uh, early projections don't show it as bad as what we anticipate. So we're starting to get kind of back into the a regular routine. Um, one of the other uh, components of kind of our, our current or our future budget is we're anticipating um, that we will see it that downturn will be a little more drastic than we originally projected in our revenues. So our budget reflects that. Uh, we don't show um, we show less or less funding sales and use tax coming in uh, over the next 12 months. So we've adjusted our board, our budget accordingly in the street fund. Um, and our, uh, we're coming up in, I believe, in August to present the capital budget to council. Uh, and it reflects um, some of the, uh, um, we kind of got hit in the street fund a little bit sideways, not just a reduction in revenues, but an example of this is the, uh, with the advent of a $4 million grant, we now have to, had to accelerate the, uh, the railroad quiet zones. Uh, we were hoping to spread that out over about, over about four or five years. We had to accelerate that to about a three year time frame. So um, it's a little bit different, um, but we are weathering it. Um, still continue with uh, our safety programs or some of our smaller scale projects. Uh, we'll still be doing our road resurfacing, um, curb work. Uh, we're a little more selective in some of our capital projects for the next five years. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Jacques, was that a, was that a, a follow-up? Yeah, um, yeah. So first off, Jim, I feel your pain <laughs> based on what I'm going through similarly. Um, I was curious, I know we went through and we had like a list of all these projects. Um, I don't know if it was the TIP or it, maybe it was just the CIP. Uh, but I was wondering at what point should we expect to see kind of a revised schedule? Like what's kind of the new plan, so to speak? Is that something that we're going to get to see in a month or two? Um, I. Certainly, I think that's something realistic we can put together for uh, a quick presentation for the next meeting, show you kind of where we're where we're going, what we're proposing for next year's budget, and then for the the following four years beyond that, um, for for what impacts will be, and then you know we we approve council will be approving next year's you know funding um, as uh, I always like to say a budget is should be, should be a fluid wow. document. That's the dog behind me. Um, <laughs> always fun to, to work from home, um, but it's a fluid document. So as as those revenues, if the revenue situation changes, uh, taking a more conservative approach, if we get, a, get get good news, there's always an advent to change things throughout the course of the year. So uh, we can certainly put something together. Um, we're going to be doing it for council. We can certainly put, bring it together for uh, run it through uh, TAB uh, at the next meeting. Okay, that'd be great. And I'm also... Because I imagine once you start going conservative, it does take time to ramp back up. And so I was thinking you might have impacts to this year, or is that not the case so much? Um, well, there were a few things, mostly in design. Um, we can, as part of the presentation to you, we can show you what we're doing this year. We have a lot out there in capital. Okay, we just started uh, County Line Road project, which has kind of been been dragging along and floating. Uh, we're still working on Pike Road. Okay, we're finishing up a drainage project on 17th and Main. Um, we've got the, the paving programs is is going hot and heavy this year. Tyler's working on a traffic signal at uh, Alpine Mountain View. Uh, so we've got quite a few things currently going on right now uh, that'll take us well into the fall. So we'll 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 we can include that. Here's what we got now. Here's what, you know, kind of short term, what we're looking at for, you know, into the fall and, and uh, next winter under design and then going through and, and carrying forward with construction in next summer. Okay. So that's great. So it sounds like the impact really not what we're feeling right now, but what might be down the line a little bit. We have a, we have a lot going on right now that, that is, is continuing on. Um, yeah. we're, we've had some, there's some staffing challenges. So we're trying to adjust uh, here and there. Uh, most of staff, uh, and we, you know, it'll, this will fall into the Climate Action Task Force. Most of the engineering staff uh, through the whole course of this has been working remotely. 
uh, we've all, you know, very few, few of our staff um, come into the office. We're all working, trying to work remotely as much as possible. Um, helps a lot with greenhouse gases. Uh, people aren't commuting as much anymore. So um, that's a positive. Maybe the only thing, the only positive thing coming out of this whole thing. Yes, yeah, very true. Willing your puppy gets a little more time with the family, so. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And pets. Don't forget the pets. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Anything else on the communication from staff, from uh, uh, any members of staff there? We actually have quite a few more things, but I'm just going to save them till the end of the meeting if you guys want to. Uh, we, we probably need to progress and get to the big item on, on the agenda tonight. It's, it's going to take a bit of your time. So uh, we have okay. some other things. So if you have questions, we can probably answer those too for the, the items from uh, TAB members. Okay, Sandy, do you have a quick question or, or uh, should it be until the, uh, the comments from board members? Well, I just was wondering about RTD because they presented before we left our, our last meeting and due to COVID, they were making changes. How has that impacted our bus service here? Um, have the routes changed? Times changed? Just general stuff like that. And the answer can wait, but that's what I wondered about. Thank you. Yeah, I can answer that at the items from uh, TAB members at the end, because I do have something on that. Okay, sounds good. Duly noted. All right, well, marching forward, do we have any members of the public uh, to be heard today? I haven't seen anyone call in. Um, I don't recognize all the names on the participants list, so I can't honestly say for sure we don't have somebody waiting in the list. Tyler, Bill, maybe you know all the names on the participants list. I don't know the T-E-R-A-N, Turan, or is that somebody from the consulting team? Hello? Hey, Phil, this is Sarah. They're not with our our consulting team. Oh, okay. So they might be just listening in. Um, okay. I'm not. Oh, Taryn is Ben Ortiz. Never mind. Terry. <laughs> it's Terry. I got it. Thanks, Ben. Hey, Ben. Good to have you here. Okay. You may not be able to uh, have audio, so. Fair enough. Last call for any members of the public uh, uh, to share their, uh, or their comment now. All right, hearing none, why don't we turn it on over to uh, Lisa and Francie and team. Great, thank you guys so much. Uh, thanks for having us and getting us some time on your agenda. I'm gonna jump right in and hopefully all this great technology will work for us. Okay. Of course, I tried this earlier before everyone got on and it worked fine. And now, are you guys seeing anything on your side? Not yet, Lisa, but now we can. Oh. Yep, there it is. Yep, just popped up. Oh. Okay, you can see it now? Yep. Okay. And I put it in slideshow here for you. I've gotten so used to Zoom that, as I think somebody else was saying, trying to do the transition back and forth from different technologies takes them getting used to, for sure. Okay, there we go. All right, so as many of you probably know, we've been working for the last six months or so after the uh, council declared a climate emergency um, in, back in October and called for the convening of a climate action task force. Uh, so that kicked off in December. And we had been working along, developing our recommendations report, and then obviously COVID hit. So that kind of postponed things for, for a couple of months there, but we uh, got back on it and just presented our recommendations report to city council of the beginning of July. And city council wanted us then to take the recommendations to the advisory boards and get some feedback from you all to bring back to them. So we're gonna run through that tonight. 
And I'm going to run through the, so there are, are six topic areas that I'll talk about. I'm going to run through the non-transportation one re related ones pretty quickly, but we'll spend most of the time on the transportation recommendations because those are obviously most relevant to you all. And in the meantime, feel free to holler if you all have any clarifying questions or anything like that. Um, so if you, for those of you who don't know me, I'm sorry, I'm Lisa Knobloch, the Sustainability Program Manager. So this just provides you a brief overview of what the report itself covered. Uh, it, it ended up being quite a substantive document around 150 pages or so. Uh, so if, if any of you, I know you got the link to that in your packets. Um, I don't know how much, how many of you actually read it from cover to cover, but um, there's, it goes into the, the background of the Climate Action Task Force, the recommendations, also some recommendations from the Just Transition Plan Committee, which Francie will be talking about in a little bit, community engagement, and then just a ton of resources that were provided to that group. The task force came up with six primary topic areas that they wanted to focus on uh, to develop recommendations. So it was adaptation and resilience, building energy use, education and outreach, land use and waste, man waste management, renewable energy and transportation, and then equity was also identified as a really integral um, part of climate action. And rather than having its own section with really specific recommendations, they wanted to weave equity throughout all of these topic areas. And then that also lead into the work that the Climate Action Task Force did with the Just Transition Plan Committee, which again, Francie will talk about. Oh, come on. Here we go. So we did endeavor to do some community engagement in this process. We thought we were already working under a 120 day deadline, which was pretty tight, um, but then COVID happened and obviously all of our community engagement that was meant to be in person, uh, which was really designed to try to get at that equity standpoint and get a more um, broad and diverse perspective from the community engagement standpoint was all um, really, uh, pretty significantly impacted. So we did, we were able to put out a community questionnaire and we got um, almost 400 responses to that. We did do a handful of presentations and tabling events before um, lockdown happened. Um, but we know that even through that process, we were pretty limited in terms of the engagement that we were able to do. Uh, we did get some key takeaways. So there, at least from the folks that were able to participate in that, there's general support for climate actions, incentives, and, and overall changes from the city standpoint. In particular, there was strong support for increasing services and benefits, particularly for low-income communities and addressing issues around affordability and making sure that any measures that we are taking from a climate action perspective uh, are taking affordability into account. On the flip side of that, there, there was some current concern definitely about the cost and the impact on affordability of climate action measures and then a lack of stakeholder engagement as well. And, um, as I mentioned, we had some significant limitations. We were working under a pretty fast timeline, the impacts from COVID. Uh, the questionnaire format was a little bit, um, I would say constrained in terms of it, it really forced people to rank their options and didn't provide people an option to say, I actually don't like any of these options that you're giving me. So there was some limitations in that. And then again, we think that from from the responses that we got, we, we know that there were pretty key um, perspectives and voices that we're not able to engage in that process. So I'm gonna jump into the recommendations. And like I said, I'm gonna speed through the ones that really aren't transportation focused, but if you have any um, clarifying questions, please feel free to holler. Uh, Francie is jotting down notes and we have kind of two separate documents. Um, one that's kind of a more formal document that will go to council saying this is what the Transportation Advisory Board thinks about these recommendations. And then we can also take notes just on individual comments if you have um, comments related to some of the other recommendations and you want them to be successful. So we'll review and record high-level comments. Again, Francie will do that, and at the end, we'll pull up that document so you guys can see it. And then we'll go through each of the transportation-related um, recommendations and have you all do kind of a thumbs up, thumbs side, or thumbs down. Uh, and then take a general agreement, and then you all will vote as a board in terms of how you want to move those forward to council. So the first topic area is focused on adaptation and resilience. And 
Uh, this, most of the recommendations are focused on greenhouse gas um, reductions overall, which we refer to as mitigation. But we do also know that even if Longmont were to achieve 100% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 or whatever, the way um, science works and the way the world works, we are still probably looking at some um, significant impacts from climate change. And so this section is really focused on how do we prepare our community for those impacts. Uh, the one, the first one is focused on public health, and that's looking at what are the impacts of a warming climate on the public health of our community. The second one is water conservation, and I highlighted this one in green, and we'll um, discuss this a little bit more in detail later. Even though this is focused on water conservation, and I highlighted it as being relevant to the Transportation Advisory Board, because if you see this goal, it's a 35 to 40% reduction in overall water consumption by 2025. Uh, that could have significant impacts to the look of right of ways in particular. And so we just wanted to highlight that for this group and, um, so that you all have an opportunity to uh, discuss and provide comments on particularly around how that might impact the look and feel of right of ways. And then the third is focused on flood mitigation and preparedness. Building energy, sorry, I know there's a ton of text on here. Um, that's focused on probably things that you would expect. So. Uh, building code, so that's looking at the next building code cycle of expanding that. Longman is really good about adopting and implementing the most recent version of each building code cycle. But this one would be looking specifically at adding in solar readiness, um, EV readiness and electrification. Uh, also looking at creating an electrification feasibility committee to de develop a plan uh, for the city to transition from natural gas to electrification in buildings uh, over the next 10 to 15 years. And that, that feasibility committee would, would really help develop what that plan looks like. Commercial energy benchmarking, um, that's a program that's looking at evaluating buildings to educate building owners on how to reduce energy use. Commercial and residential energy efficiency, low income energy efficiency, and then establishing a climate action fund that can help um, again, particularly address the affordability issue of potential impacts to low and middle um, income residents and business owners to help them in that transition process. Education and outreach. This is mostly focused on uh, a number of things to help just gain better awareness by the public and engagement in the conversation around climate issues and climate action. So there is a lecture series, an article series, looking at uh, adding to the teaching exhibit at the museum called Front Range Rising to add issues of climate and energy use, uh, establishing a community liaison program. So that's setting up a peer-to-peer -peer network within neighborhoods of folks that are like sustainability and climate ambassadors that can educate their friends and neighbors. And then the, the bigger piece one here is really developing uh, comprehensive workforce development opportunities to train the workforce that we're really going to need to accomplish our climate action goals. So that's in those areas, particularly around energy use, energy efficiency, weatherization, renewable energy use. Land use and waste management. Uh, the first one is focusing on uh, promoting and educating and changing code to allow for home scale agriculture production and sales. Uh, expanding residential and resident, residential and commercial composting. And then I, this is in the land use section, but this third one here is downtown pay for parking. Uh, I highlighted this one obviously because of the tie to transportation and parking as well, which I think Phil was talking about a little bit earlier. And that's implementing a pay to park requirement in the downtown area to help encourage alternative modes of travel into and out of downtown. And this one really, so we started this process as I mentioned before COVID happened. So this one also would really need to probably be put on hold or we need to really pay attention to what the impacts might be to our downtown uh, businesses because we definitely don't want to have any uh, adverse impacts beyond what people are already experiencing during this pandemic. Renewable energy, this is looking at accelerating the installation of smart meters and then developing a number of programs that really help homeowners understand and um, mitigate their energy use within their own homes. And then a broader network that helps actually connect 
uh, things like home energy management systems to our overall system and have folks opt into programs where, where they could actually say, yes, I agree for uh, Longmont Power and Communications to um, manage my energy use during peak times and, and folks will get you know, incentives or uh, reduced rates for that behavior. Uh, carbon intensity signaling, so that's uh, providing real-time information to customers to say, you know, hey, the energy mix right now is really heavy on renewables, so you might want to kick on your appliances, or hey, right now the energy uh, production, power production is really heavy on fossil fuels, so if you can scale things back, please scale things back. So transportation, this is where I'm going to spend the most time, and I'm going to have Phil uh, Phil was part of this process in developing these recommendations. Sorry, there's a, one of the WebEx boxes is right over some of my, my strategies here. So, um, but Phil, I'm going to have you jump in in case I'm missing anything, get anything wrong, or if you guys have specific questions that I can't answer, I'm going to send them over Phil's way. Uh, so the first transportation recommendation is increasing the effectiveness of the transit system through a checkpoint bus service. So that's essentially a hybrid service between like a call and ride service and a fixed route service. A little bit more flexibility uh, for users that would allow folks that might not be able to make it to a formal stop. Um, the, the fixed route service will still very much be the backbone of our, of our transit system, but this would provide a little bit more flexibility uh, for folks and help uh, some of those last mile connections. Bill, do you want to add anything to that one? So sure. The uh, so the checkpoint piece of it is that it would it would hit certain important points in the city at specific times, so it still have that level of um, reliability. So you would always know, like at the hospital, it would show up at quarter past the hour. Um, you know, and, and different places, different important locations, different stops could be added into the network, but from there it could deviate from its fixed route and go, you know, and, and come right to your your front, not your front door, but to your to the curb in, curb in front of your house. So if it has that ability to make that 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 uh, that run, it could do it that way. So it's just a bit more flexible service. It's something that was actually um, in a 2012 plan for first and main street, and it was never implemented by RTD, though, they were very excited about it at first, and then they kind of lost a little bit of interest based on some costs. But we, we threw it back in here because we still think it's a viable service. Yeah, and the, and the goal would really be to be at or below the cost of the current, um, um, like, via or call and ride system, right, so, right, Bill? Yeah, those are pretty expensive right now, running about... 25 to 30 dollars in fact sandra probably knows more than, or sandy knows more than i do about that but uh they run very expensive per um per writer and we try to get those costs down quite a bit so yeah great thank you um the second one is focusing on establishing electric vehicle charging infrastructure particularly in the downtown area uh, so that's increasing uh, 20 additional what are called level two charging stations so that's where you can charge your car if you were going from zero to 100%, it would take a few hours. But if you're just doing some shopping for, you know, an hour or so, it would help you know get your get your car charged pretty quickly. It would help bring people to the downtown area that are looking to charge in Longmont uh, and help from that economic standpoint as well. Uh, the third one is looking at connected bikeways, and so that's a, a longer term uh, project that's really trying to connect all the bikeways and interconnect all major nodes across the city so that you would have a complete and safe bikeway system where you don't have to make any um, at grade crossings. Bill, do you want to add some, anything to that one? Well, I don't think we're saying uh, any at grade crossings, but we're saying definitely whenever you cross an arterial level street, you know, one of the higher volume multi-lane roads, we would, we would be looking at trying to get some kind of um, Great separation for those for sure. And then it was just an idea. This was critical from the group was that uh, they really saw bicycling as being kind of that next level. And I think we're seeing that even with COVID is bicycling has become that thing that people have turned to if they can't, 
they don't want to use the bus necessarily transit. So bicycling is becoming part of that. And we're starting to see more and more electric bicycles and different types of bicycles like tricycles, electric tricycles. So it's becoming more and more uh, commonplace for people to be able to use these types of uh, vehicles. And so uh, this is the idea that we get them around the city in, a, in an efficient manner. Great, thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, and that one is one, again, we started this before COVID, but obviously the, the connections to the COVID are, are pretty stark. And when, when I hand it over to Sarah and Abby to talk about the transportation roadmap, um, they'll speak a little bit to that as well. Of, of the, the impact of transportation from COVID is something that, that is, there's just a lot of unknown right now in terms of how people's behavior is gonna turn is going to change moving into the future. And then the last one that we have is focused on alternative work schedules. And again, even though we started this before COVID, this one's particularly relevant uh, because it's really looking at uh, developing an education campaign for both employers and employees to help reduce meeting congestion through either alternative work schedules, uh, additional telecommuting options, uh, and things like that um, that really help reduce congestion during those peak periods, as I'm sure you all have probably paid attention to, our ozone levels have been quite high. Uh, and obviously I made a note over on the left here that transportation is about 19% of long months greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so transportation has a pretty heavy impact. Um, it's interesting to see how telecommuting from due to the pandemic is, is impacting those emissions and potentially some of our long-term behaviors as well, I think is opening up some new opportunities for us there. So that's it as far as the transportation recommendations. Uh, before we move on to the Just Transition Plan Committee recommendations, does anyone have any uh, questions or comments or anything that they wanna add at this time? And then we'll get into the voting in a little bit here, but I just wanna make sure there's some time for questions. Yeah, Council Member Peck. I do, um, and these are just things for the board uh, to think about not necessarily things that I have any uh, knowledge, super knowledge about. And my first one is to Phil, when we're talking about connected bikeways, the recommendation is to have this in 20 years. Does this align with staff's vision? Because um, 20 years is even further out than the 2030 timeline that we have for uh, climate action emergency for renewable energy. So I'm wondering if that, is that aligned with what we've been trying to accomplish? Um, that's a great question, Council Member Peck. Uh, the full text, if you looked at the full text of this, I believe it's, it talks about a 20 or a 10 significant, um, significant work being done in the next 10 years. And so I think the, the idea was this doesn't, you know, if, if we're to talk to all the folks uh, that have anything to do with transportation, this is not part of that work plan as of yet, but it's in a lot of different documents in different ways, but there's no timing associated with it. So what this attempts to do is, um, you know, allow TAB to, to recommend to council that these be included. And then if this gets into a work plan of some kind for council, then that's, something we'd have to take on and, and evaluate how that works with the budget. And so, yeah, it's very aggressive, quite frankly. I mean, it seems like 20 years is a long way out. But if you think about all the different underpasses that we're talking about, I mean, we do have a number of those in our work plan right now, but in order to complete the full system, it's going to be, um, it's going to be quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of work. So what we're trying to do is put it out there as something to kind of aspire to as a goal. And again, the full text kind of talks about major completion within 10 years to meet some of the goals you're talking about, council member. Okay, and the reason I asked was I'm reading the T3 connected bikeways, which is on the thing and on the screen and it says, construct most of the system within the next two years, TO. So there's a typo there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that should have been 10 years. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then full completion in 20 years. I just wanted to make sure. And then I do have another question. It is uh, the T1, the downtown pay to park by 2023. 
but we just talked about an integrated bus system, which I totally agree with, but you want that according to the timeline by 2025. My thought process is if we are going to have people take alternate routes downtown, and if they don't, they have to pay to park, should these timelines not be somewhat aligned? We can't uh, ask them to get downtown in another way other than driving if we don't have that alternate way in, in place. That's just a thought going forward when we talk about this. And then my other thought, as you can see, I've been thinking a lot about this, um, are the charging stations. And I had earlier before this uh, Climate Action Task Force came about, I had a conversation with uh, Harold Dominguez about these charging stations. I think the city should be in the position of selling electricity. Um, and like the downtown parking stations, whoever owns those, if it's the LDDA, my thought process is they should be putting them in and then we sell them. They charge whatever they want to pay for the electricity that the city sells them. I'm just very nervous about the city, just like we don't have gas stations in parking lots. I mean, why would we do that? So um, I could be totally wrong on this thought process, but I just think this is opening up a, a, a discussion that the city may not be able to afford to do. So just putting that out there. Thank you. Are there any other questions or, or comments? Yeah, Courtney, and I can't see everybody, so I'm gonna call on who I see, but um, Neil, I'm gonna look to you because hopefully you can see everybody. It's the blind leading the blind. I only see uh, just a, a fraction of it, so we'll just invite people to uh, to call them uh, to call okay. identify themselves if they're interested in, in raising okay. a, a, a All right. question. All right, but Courtney, I did see your hand. Yes, thank you. Um, my question is about paying to park. Are there studies from other cities where pay to park has been implemented, and has it shown to reduce uh, parking or congestion or car parking downtown? And has it also shown, therefore, to increase uh, public transportation use or shuttles? I, I saw, I read about the shuttles, and you know all these other options, possibly even using like the school buses and that kind of thing, which seemed very interesting to me. So, wondering if it actually does reduce the amount of use of parking or does it uh, as the document shown uh, just allow people who have the money to use it and and just discriminate if you will against or uh, disallow equity for people who can't afford to do it thank you yeah courtney i'll try to take that one um and i think poor ben ortiz is chomping at the bit um and he can't say anything right now but he actually Used to be, uh, used to take a class from a professor, um, Donald Shoup from UCLA, who uh, who wrote the, a great book called uh, the high high price of the high cost of free parking. And so, it really talks about how people can can take, you know, th that's a free resource that's provided by the city basically for private vehicles to take to store on on public property. So, it's an interesting way of looking at things. But we've actually looked at a number of studies across the nation. Um, and that book kind of outlines a lot of the studies as well. But if you get a chance, um, uh, we can get, get you, we can try to get you a copy or, or or send it your way if you have a lot of interest in this. But it really does talk about trying to add a cost to parking so that there's always 15% open, so that you're not driving around in circles, wasting gasoline, polluting the environment, trying to find that one parking spot that's right where you want it to be. So by charging for parking, you're actually Making it more efficient, and then that those dollars that you charge for parking go back into the area which which is being served. So they actually go back to the down. You know, in this case, it would be the downtown development authority, and that can make it easier to get access, and it can provide some of those shuttles that we were talking about in the document. You can you can start to pay for some of those things using the price that you charge for parking, and it it's just that guarantee that reliability again. You know, we just talked about that reliability piece for transportation of being able to come downtown and be assured that you're gonna find that spot, not today because we've got them all blocked off on Main Street, but someday, you know, and especially on the Avenue, that you always have about 15% full, 85% is kind of that magic number that you're looking for of, of utilization. So you're trying to get it up to that level. Um, and then we talked with council the other night about 
the idea that anybody with a placard that has for, you know, they, they, it's kind of an older term now. It's, you know, it shouldn't really be the Americans with Disability Act placard, but we still call them the handicap placards or the handicap license plates. If you have those, you can park in any of these stalls um, as long as you need to. Um, so there's no there's no restrictions on those types of placards and license plates now. So if you do have a disability, if you need to come downtown, we're not going to try to charge you for that or or make it inconvenient for you. Now, if you are low income, we did talk about that issue of how does a low income person access these parking spaces if you're going to start charging for them. And that's the best solution that we came up with was providing these shuttle services that if you did have to use outlying parking, you at least have a quick trip on some of these shuttle services that would take you into downtown fairly quickly, especially if you work downtown and have satellite parking lots kind of on the edges. And so we had a bunch of different things that we tried to work into this document to cover a lot of these fears that people were having. Great. Are there other questions from uh, board members? Yeah, hey, this is Jacques. I got a couple questions here. Uh, so the first one I had is when you were talking about that shuttle, um, I started thinking, it, has there been any thought about using that Kaufman redesign and being kind of a north-south sort of transportation line? Just a thought, um, so you can answer that. Uh, but then my other question was on the flex ride, I believe, I'm trying to, reach back in my memory banks here, but I believe the call and ride service is required within a half mile of a fixed route. And that's due to ADA, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, not so quite. I'm not sure if, have you thought about that requirement with this plan? Yeah, the actual uh, legislature, the actual rule in the ADA is that there must be um, accessible accessoride is what it's called from RTD. They have accessoride service that's within, within that half mile of a fixed route service that operates all day long. So they do have to provide that service, but it does cost a lot. Um, actually in Longmont, quite frankly, it's free because of the ride free Longmont system that we have, but typically it's, it, it's a, it's a full fare price for that. So the call and ride would be something a little different. And we would have to replicate. So wherever you had the fixed routes or the fixed bus stops, you would have to have that ADA service provided. But um, that would be a point that you'd have to provide that around. So we might, there might be some issues there. You're correct. We'd have to go into the legalities of all those different things. So those would be something that we'd have to look at, uh, especially carefully with changing this from a fixed route to more of a, uh, a flexible route. And then your other question was about the, the shuttle and using Kaufman. So um, we've certainly talked about that Kaufman just makes a lot of sense in using that shuttle, but then you could also use, Kimbark seems to make a lot of sense as well. So uh, we were trying to figure out how you can make it work. Uh, we probably try to stay out of the alleys, but Kim, Kimbark and Kaufman would be, would be ideal. Yes. That sounds good. Um, yeah, and just a quick anecdotal story. In my brief experience, about three, four months of using FlexRide, every time I get on that bus, there's someone there that I don't think they would have the ability to walk more than maybe a block. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think it would really cause a hardship um, if they didn't have that service. So that's just my anecdotal. Right, and I don't think we're trying to get rid of the service. We're trying to enhance it. And kind of build it into a better system of services and that could also include even you know partnering with i hate to say it the ubers and lifts of the world because you never know what's going to go on with uber and Lyft, right but uh they seem to be pretty popular now because people are kind of moving to that from public transportation because they feel uh it's a little safer more safer environment so we're seeing those in other cities not necessarily longmont but it's a, it's about bringing all these different systems together you talk about the bikeways and the flex ride and you know we haven't talked about regional transit and the accessor ride but it's it's talking about them all together as one system even you know single occupant vehicles and and hovs and and the, the van pools and talking about it all as a system i mean if we were to write the perfect document i think that's where we would try to say we're trying to integrate all these different things but um 
these are the full the, the pieces that we were able to pull out. But the whole time we were talking about the integration of the system and trying to get it all to work together uh, as best we could. I think David had a question. Uh, yes, thank you. I have two. Uh, one has to do with the parking. So I, I might have missed this in the document, but are we just talking about Main Street or is this also Kaufman, Kimbark and other parts of town? I think we're looking at the, and this is again, pre-COVID, this is a pre-COVID idea. So as the businesses are hurting right now and parking isn't an issue, this doesn't make sense to do today, or even it's something that you could turn off if it was to happen again in the future. But the parking was really meant to be an area wide uh, parking plan, not just on Main Street, but all the different uh, public parking lots that are available, like you said, on Kimbark, on Kaufman, um, and so the idea is to, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe you could start with Main Street or some of the avenues, the on-street parking, and move them to the, the, the lots, but um, it could be a phased approach to this whole, this whole idea. But it would start with a, a downtown core where there was a lot of demand, you know, five or six months ago, and, and people were really having a difficult time parking, and, and now that's not really the case, even, even though we've taken away about 70 parking spaces off of Main Street, people are still having a pretty easy time of parking as we understand it. So, um, but when you have those high demand areas and maybe the next place you look at is maybe Prospect, but first you start with the downtown core. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, se the second thing, and this is more towards Lisa, uh, she mentioned um, water reduction impacts. And I'd be curious if she could just spend a minute or two talking more about um, what what that might look like? She mentioned how the green space, how it might impact the green space. Yeah. So, uh, and I I might have Francie step in here if I miss anything too. She's our water conservation and sustainability specialist, so that's definitely her realm. But this area is is looking at um, what are the potential impacts to our water availability due to climate change, and how it might we mitigate our water use in order to to make sure that we can weather those impacts and so the goal that the climate action task force came up with is the reduction of 35 to 40 percent of our citywide water use by 2025 which is a pretty aggressive pretty aggressive goal and one of the things that that we talked about as staff when we went to city council is that in order to implement that and achieve that goal one we know that that would take financial resources it also would require some pretty significant redesign. We spoke more specifically about parks and golf courses, but as I mentioned, right of ways as well, which to be, you know, grassy areas and things like that. So we would be looking at a transition away from any of those type of uses that require more water to zero gardening use of, of native plant materials and things like that to radically cut our water particularly around irrigation. So you think about, um, people often think of when we talk about xeriscaping as, oh, it's just gonna be, you know, rocks and there's nothing there. And that's that's not true. Um, there, there's quite a bit of, of drought resistant native materials that we can use that actually, you know, they flower, they look beautiful, but they require a lot less in terms of water use. But it is a transition away from what people are used to doing. Uh, which is more turf grass. Francie, do you want to add anything to that that I might have missed? No, I think you covered it. Um, I couldn't give you an answer of what everything would look like because uh, it was a pretty high level recommendation, uh, just that uh, our landscape for it to reach a, a reduction of that magnitude, we'd have to re on our landscapes. So, so our, so where is all the other, so that, do you have any kind of um, thoughts as, uh, let's say we just magically shut off all the water to the golf courses and the parks just for a day to find out how much money, how much water we'd save. Is that 30% of our daily usage? 50, I know it'd be more in the um, summer. It's it, a, Oh, I would I would have to pull it up. Our city water usage, and it's hard because our golf courses and a lot of our parks use raw water. 
um, which it's much easier. The city it's for tracking water consumption. It's much easier for the ch city to track treated water than raw water. So unfortunately, we do not have uh, a really accurate. I could put an estimate of both our raw water versus treated water, uh, but do not have that right now. Um, so that's kind of a little bit hard to see, and we often, when looking at water conservation savings, focus on the treated water rather than the raw water. Um, so on for and city treated water use is not not thirty percent of all city treated water use. So answering your question, <laughs> we, would, we would need to uh, residential. At, so just looking at treated water use, residential water use is our highest um, usage. And um, I can I have a spreadsheet that I could pull up and check. Great. In the interest of time, why don't we keep uh, 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 Lisa and Francie, why don't you uh, uh, keep marching forward on your slides? And uh, I'm sure there'll be additional questions as we go forward. Sounds good. Thanks, Neil. So I'm going to pass it off to Francie, and she's just going to really quickly go through, uh, talk about the Just Transition Plan Committee, and who they are and their equity recommendations and how uh, it's relevant. And I think this might help speak to some of the equity questions that came up in that discussion now around impacts to different folks on from the transportation recommendations. Uh, so Francie, I'm going to mute myself when you want me to advance the slide. Thank you. Um, so before getting into this background slide, oh, um, also, uh, Lisa introduced me, um, but I'm Francie Jack, Water Conservation and Sustainability Specialist. Um, so before diving into this background slide, um, this section, I'm going to focus on the Just Transition Plan recommendations and starting with kind of reviewing this background and then diving into the recommendations, kind of a distinction between the Just Transition Plan and the Climate Action Task Force. So the climate action task force were really what, like what actions you need to take to address climate change. Why this is more the how can you do it in a way that's reaching um, all members of our community. Right now, these slides are just informational as we're still waiting um, for direction from city council of whether they want us to apply these recommendations or not to the climate action task force recommendations. Um, some context for this group, this, the, this group is also is part of a, a just transition process that actually started in 2018 and what came out of the resolu resolution to transition to 100% renewable energy. So we actually did, um, did some surveys last summer to, and it was originally more focused on energy specifically. So the surveys and listening sessions um, targeted lower income households um, to learn kind of access to energy services and programs. Um, and then we are going to transition to developing policy and program recommendations by pulling together a group to support staff in that effort. But the passing of the climate emergency resolution called to engage frontline communities. And the goal of the just transition plan committee was to gather um, um, lower income and frontline communities. So we thought this was a good um, opportunity to uh, reach the goals of that resolution by broadening their scope to equitable climate action. Um, the members of this group are specifically targeted to be uh, members who are part of populations that may be most impacted by climate change, but have historically been less involved in the decision making process or historically have had policies that may have negatively impacted them. I know we talked about people with disabilities. There's still probably many how, um, how, uh, buildings out there that aren't ADA accessible, um, as well as a, a connection to the community. Next slide. Oh, you can skip this side. Um, so their recommendations were split in two parts. Um, the first is their equity assessment recommendations. And these recommendations are really about, they're kind of recommending the just transition plan process of the importance of providing both the foundation and equity and climate action using the equity lens and then focusing on frontline communities that are most impacted by climate change. Next slide. Then the bulk of their recommendations were in this overarching equitable climate action recommendations. All eight of these rec recommendations 
um, really could be used as an equity lens when implementing climate action. So they highlight the importance of in marketing, outreach, engaging cultural brokers and developing culturally relevant messaging using data and research, identifying barriers um, and increasing program access, um, kind of understanding the interconnections between health and safety, understanding and addressing financial burdens, kind of building more neighborhood based programs. Um, I skipped one. Um, there's supposed to be a four here. And it's equitable access to jobs. So building on the workforce development program. Um, and then as well as identifying alternative mechanisms, funding mechanisms. And a lot of these recommendations are written in a way that there's a lot of questions. So when someone's implementing a climate action recommendation in like in looking in the program access, there's a there's a series of questions that someone could or a staff or others who are implementing that could think through to identify areas of potential lack of program access or barriers or ways to increase program access. And um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Francie. Um, so with that, I'm going to move into this voting process. Um, and so again, we really want to we'll run through each of those transportation recommendations and the way we want to do this is if we could get and we'll see we might have to I'm just trying to figure out how we'll do this because I can't see everybody. Um, this is where zoom makes it a little bit easier, I think, um, but we'll do a thumbs up is you're you're good with the recommendation as is um, that you're you're you feel comfortable telling city council. Yep, we we approve this recommendation. A thumb side, which is um, it's okay if you use some work and you have a suggestion on, on modification about how you would how you would make it better so that you could be a thumbs up um, or a thumbs down, which is no really strong concerns and this recommendation should not um, be approved by city council. And then we'll kind of look at everybody's votes collectively and come up with a vote for each of the transportation recommendations that the board um, can say collectively, uh, this is what we want to submit to city council. Does Great, so Lisa, are you going to be talking through each of the individual items that we previously went through and, and, and asked for feedback, or are you going to be introducing uh, some new ideas at this point? No, it's, the, it's the ones that we just went through, and we'll just be asking for the thumbs up, thumbs side, or thumbs down. I just wanted you guys to see them all first. Um, and then if there's more discussion or more questions, we can go through that. Does that make sense? Yeah, would it be helpful if we were to um, pull off the slide view so you can see everyone uh, on, on one screen and you can just talk to each of the individual yeah. items? Yeah, that'd be great. We'll do that. And then while I'm doing that, Francie's going to, like I said, document everything and then she'll pull up the document at the end so you guys can see and make sure we captured everything. Wonderful. So, out of my sharing screen here. Okay. Uh -huh. That's a great idea. Neil. Okay. And then if you need me to share so we can um, you can see the text of those recommendations. We can. Okay, so the first one that we have uh, is the water conservation one again, like I said, that that could have a, a significant impacts on the right of way. So that will be the first one. So if everyone can show me a thumbs up thumbs sideways or thumbs down and just hold it up so i can see okay and how many board members do we have neil so i can yeah so right now we have uh, five active board members we're in the process okay. of adding a few more okay great so do do your thumbs one more time sorry i can't I you. perfect okay i thought so thumbs up for everybody great all right good to go the next one is the land use and waste management, the pay for downtown, the downtown pay for parking. So thumbs up, thumbs side, thumbs down. Okay. We got three thumbs up, two thumbs side. Okay. And, so, and just quick comment on the on the thumb side there. Yep. I, I support I support the uh, the goal of it, uh, uh, but it would very much depend on the timing of the rollout, obviously. Um, okay. The impact to business owners right now is is, is pretty significant, but you know a couple of years down the road would 100% support the the policy. Perfect. And Sandra, you have the thumb side. 
Same. And I agree with Neil. I think it's too much now, but on down the road, I, I, I would be in agreement. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Guys. All right. And then the transportation ones we have. The first one is the checkpoint slash flexible bus service. All right. We got four thumbs up and Jaco thumb side. So tell me about your thumb side. Uh, this kind of has to do with the comments that I made. I, I didn't feel like we had a really solid plan for. It. I understand the integration and the desire, but I didn't hear enough to sign off on it. Um, it does that make sense? It's like I, you just I need felt, more need more details of, about the implementation. Yeah, a lot of question marks, and and again, I I really think about those individuals that this would impact, and I'm not. I'm not necessarily sure that Uber Lyft is going to be a suitable substitute for those folks. Great. Thanks, John. Okay. The electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Thumbs. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. All right. Thumbs up. Great. I, I have a comment on that one. Yes. I, I, I'd like to I'd like to uh, just align with uh, what uh, Joan had mentioned that I think yeah. that the uh, the businesses should certainly be a part of it. If the city's just paying for free electricity, I would disagree. Okay, great. And one quick comment on that from from my side, uh, Lisa. Uh, the number twenty charging stations seems like a really low number. In, a, in an environment where we're likely to be having a huge, huge increase in electric vehicles. So if this is a long term document, um, perhaps they need to be thinking bigger than just 20, 20 charging stations. Or, okay. or, or, or unless each charging station has multiple access points there at the station, that would be a different situation. But 20 seems low. Okay. Yep. They are usually now dual point or dual port, so you can get two at each, but we'll note that. Okay, the next one is the connected bikeways. All right. Um, <laughs> everyone thumbs up with Neil giving it a double thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> Great. And the last is the alternative work schedules. All right. Thumbs up. I'm a, I'm a thumbs up, but I have something to add. Okay. Um, it doesn't mention for folks like me that live here but work somewhere else. And um, I would be, I would love to have some kind of incentive to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not expecting Loveland to come up with it. But, uh, how know, about a pandemic? Like, <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, so I don't know. It just seems like we are leaving out a large percentage of the population if we only look at people that either work somewhere else or live somewhere and work here or live here and work here. There's either 25 to some percent that we're not considering. There might be something that can be done to encourage people that live here that work somewhere else to try and stay closer to home. I had it. I had a question about that. I, because we have been forced to do that with the pandemic, have have there been some studies started or data collected that show that we've already been doing it and how that has worked? Or how that could be projected to work in the future? Um, I, uh, there, that's definitely something I might look to Phil to see if he has seen anything come out specific to the pandemic. Um, I know we have been trying to track air quality impacts and things like that um, from what's happening, but it's going to be a while, I think, before we really know due to the pandemic and what's due to other factors um, as well. Phil, have you seen anything that's come out more? Well, all we have really is to, uh, you know, I'm, I threw Jim under the bus earlier. I might throw Tyler under the bus, but you know, we have some, we have some volume data um, on on roads, and we kind of saw what happened with the traffic traffic volumes. Uh, maybe Tyler can talk a little bit about that. Also, we've been recording, and and Jay knows a lot about this. We've been recording how many people have been coming into our work versus how many people are staying at home. So. We're at about 25 to 30 percent 
at our offices right now. And I, that's how many people are coming into the office right now, about 25 to 30% of the full staff. Yeah, so, so with traffic volumes on Main Street, we saw, and I've got a graphic I was trying to track down here real quick, but when we saw the stay at home orders come into place, we saw daily traffic volumes on Main Street. We've got a count station right there just north of Long's Peak. They, they were down about 60% lower than normal daily traffic volumes. So the month before, within about two weeks, that second week of April, traffic volumes were substantially lower. Um, and, it, and it's really cool to see kind of all the different inflection points or as each different stay at home, schools close, the volume goes down, stay at home, volume goes down. And then we started opening back up and then all of a sudden that graph starts going right back up and about two weeks ago, we were back to about 92% of pre COVID really? volumes on Main Street. So hmm. it was a nice break there for a little while while everyone was doing a really good job staying at home, but now it's it's certainly coming back quickly. Thank you. A quick question. So even with the even with the Main Street closure, you're at 92% of what we would normally be at this time of year. So we haven't checked the the after the closure yet. We'll work on that later this week. We also did some additional counts about that earlier in terms of measuring the impacts of where the traffic goes. But we'll be doing some Main Street counts this week, actually within that closure, the traffic volume impacts there. Um, we'll see where we're at in terms of that 90%, but I suspect it's, it, you see a lot of spread is what happens instead of all being in the peak hour, the peak hour really spreads. And I think a lot of what we're seeing shows that in the data, the mornings, overall, the morning hours are still below pre code It really starts picking up in noon and it's really a lot of the volume shifted later in the day and remains a little more constant. Right, part of that staying at home working. I can stay at home and do my morning emails before I go to work or some sort of something like that. I think what we also have noticed, and, and this is just kind of uh, maybe transportation planning 101, is when you have that open capacity on those roads, like the bigger arterials like Hover and, and Main Street and Pace and County Line, when you have not a lot of people using them, people are kind of drawn to them. And so luckily we saw a lot of people kind of pulled off the side streets and not maybe cutting through on Sunset and Francis and, and Martin and these different ones, they were going to the arterials, which is exactly kind of how we plan it when we're talking about transportation planning. But um, so we saw a quick return back to Main Street, which was unfortunate for us because we kept on saying, hey, we're gonna do these closures with 60% of the people gone. And all of a sudden we got these numbers that said, no, it's it's like 90% of, of normal. So um, we think that was part of the issue is, and, and we, we'd have to measure every street again to see if that was really the case, but that's just kind of the way people behave is when they see that open and they see that it's easier to drive, they get out there and they'll, they'll drive on those roads. And, and uh, we think that's what we saw. I think, and uh, we're kind of getting away from, from Lisa's goal here, but I think one of the things we saw was a lot of, I would say from my perspective, a lot more um, calls about speed. So congestion, mm -hmm some of that congestion went away opened up a lot of that capacity it's a lot easier to go faster for people and there's definitely some people that are going faster so definitely a give and take with congestion and, and ability to speed great thanks everyone well i'm going to really quickly have francie just pull up the document that she put together so we can double check that we captured everything and then I'm gonna hand it off to Sarah and Abby to just talk to you a few minutes about the transportation roadmap that we are working on. Okay, and you might have to bear with me a little bit. Uh, you are the first board we went to, so we're trying to do some, as we realize uh, implementing things, our format um, need to be adjusted a little bit. Um, so I'll probably put a, change the title of this one called, uh, do like the record on this side. So we just have kind of the record, um, but water conservation, um, I have, it was five thumbs up. There was no modification comments, downtown pay for parking. And I will try to make this a little bigger. 
Uh, two more board members um, supported the goal, but said it depended on the timeline. So I had three thumbs up, two sideways. For uh, the checkpoint service, four up, one sideways, and that was because uh, a, a desire to have a, a more solid plan and think through the impact to individuals. Um, the T2, all five thumbs up. And when someone said businesses should be part of it, but I think you were also referring to the council members comment. Do you specifically mean LDDA as uh, Joan mentioned or um, or were you specific? The, well, I, I, I essentially would be the businesses that are supporting the, the presence of that meter. So if it's in front of their businesses, they would be the ones that would benefit from it. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And then also that 20 charging stations seem low. Uh, connected bikeways, I believe it was five thumbs up, no comments. And then alternative work schedules, five thumbs up, but with a desire for those who live in Longmont, but work elsewhere, maybe consider incentive or just factor that population into the discussion. And then below, I've been trying to, I'm gonna move all these clarifying questions discussion um to a separate document uh, and i haven't fully got into fully filling this in but i was just going to for each of them and under comments just have general topic lines about what uh was discussed <laughs> and fancy there was a there was a comment from jack in the in the chat about adding the ada requirement um for call and ride factors into the plan for T1. Okay, so this one, um, so maybe specifically AD. ADA. <laughs> I'm just adding an extra. Does that look, look good to everybody? Does it look like we're missing anything or misrepresenting anything? I think you captured it well. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all for your time. If you have any other follow up questions, um, like I said, I know you probably didn't get a chance to dig into all of those 156 pages, but if you do, because you know you want to and you have follow up questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sarah and Abby, and they're just going to talk for a few minutes about the carbon free transportation roadmap that we have been working on. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, transportation is about 19% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we we got a grant for this project, uh, the transportation roadmap before the climate emergency resolution. So uh, we're trying to line all these things up uh, with information and recommendations. Um, but she'll talk to you a little bit about that project there. And um, I'm going to pull up her slides here. So, Sarah, while I'm doing that, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Sarah Davis, and I'm the lead consultant uh, working on your equitable carbon free transportation roadmap. Uh, really excited to talk to you today about where we are in the process. Um, and I'm joined by Abby Bohannon, who is the founder and co-founder and CEO of uh, AMBG, who's also been helping on the equitable engagement side. So the purpose of uh, the roadmap, kind of as Lisa mentioned, is to promote and ensure equitable access to all forms of carbon-free transportation. So we're talking about walking, uh, rolling, uh, whether in a wheelchair or some other form of uh, pedestrian mobility assistment, assistance, um, skating, biking, and also electric vehicle usage from e-bikes to passenger vehicles all the way up to transit. So we are especially focused on the equity component of this plan, uh, building off of the work through the Just Transition Plan. Uh, so we are focusing on engaging the Latinx, disability, and senior communities in particular in our outreach. And Abby will touch on that a little bit later. Next slide. 
So as Lisa mentioned, this effort is funded, is funded by the Boulder County Sustainability Tax um, and is being led by Longmont staff uh, and behind the scenes driven by three Colorado women-owned businesses. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of SRD Consulting. We're a land use planning firm based in Denver, Colorado that focuses specifically on decarbonizing and electrifying our transportation, energy, and built environment. Um, and on our team is Abby, who I'll let introduce herself with AMBG. Hey, I'm Abby. Um, I recognize some of y'all from previous calls, so apologies for the repeated presentation, but um, yeah, as, as Sarah said, um, I'm one of the co-founders of AMBG Consulting. Um, we do um, projects sort of at the intersection of public health and urban planning with a, with a pretty heavy community engagement component um, and specifically um, uplifting the voices of folks who are um, most often left out of com community decisions uh, or decisions that affect their community. Um, so um, in terms of this project, um, it sounds like, I mean, th there have been quite quite a few of um, quite a few efforts sort of happening simultaneously. Um, and obviously COVID has definitely thrown some, uh, thrown us uh, for a loop um, in terms of community engagement, um, but we're still very focused on connecting with folks who are um, not often um, at, at the table making those decisions. So. And they couldn't be with us tonight, but we're also on our consultant team is Brendel Group. They have a Fort Collins and Denver office, and they have really been helping out on the data collection and analytics side. Next slide. So this project, like a lot of the ones we've already discussed this evening, really builds off of a lot of the planning work that the city's been doing over the past several years. So the 2015-2016 Envision Longmont process, which resulted in the multimodal and comprehensive plan, um, is definitely the basis for this, as well as the 2018 Sustainability Plan, which called out a plan like this specifically, um, and the October 2019 Climate Emergency Declaration by City Council. So we're really focused on trying to provide the city an implementation focused path forward um, between today where we're in 2020 and 2050, where we're really trying to achieve that 33% uh, emissions reduction from the transportation sector specifically. So our goals are broken down and some of these are interrelated, of course, um, are really focused on decreasing transportation related emissions. Uh, we all breathe the same air. So at the end of the day, we all have a part to play in making sure that it's emission free as possible. Uh, reducing single occupancy vehicle miles traveled. So getting creative about how we bundle trips or shift modes, uh, as well as increasing electrification uh, and increasing air quality. One point I'll make about increasing electrification, the data that we're seeing from Longmont, so including the air uh, quality measure uh, indicators that you have now, as well as your historic data, show that EVs are really critical to meeting the 33% reduction goal by 2050. So while this plan does touch on all forms of carbon-free transportation, and we really believe that transit is the solution as much as e-bikes are the solution, and all of these things are getting us to our goal, uh, we, we really have a part of this to play where EVs individually owned, fleet owned and operated um, from passenger vehicles all the way up to transit is really going to be key. And that's part and parcel with the city making the 100% renewable energy commitment. Obviously, where the fuel comes from for these vehicles is key. And so you'll see in our final roadmap report where we actually track the data for when Platte River Power Authority is going to be transitioning some of their coal fire power plants. So as the grid is becoming greener, uh, we can show that even transit becomes uh, an emission-free mode for getting around town when they're electrified. Uh, next slide. So our schedule shifted a little, of course, of, because of COVID. We actually kicked this off back in April. Our proposal did not contemplate COVID at all. So um, luckily, AMBG has been a great partner in coming up with creative ways to continue the community engagement. 
Uh, we are targeting a fall adoption by city council. So we're looking at the September city council meeting, which as some of the dates at the bottom note um, is actually a really good time considering the content of this roadmap. The bike to work day for Colorado has been rescheduled to September 22nd and the last week of September, first week of October is national drive electric week. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So this is just a slide to kind of show you that we're looking at all the different aspects of this. And, and Lisa, I don't know if this is showing up on other people's screens, but I have a little gray box kind of shading this slide. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we're looking at not only physical improvements, which we understand the budget limitations that COVID has, has created. So some of those are maybe getting pushed out a little bit further, um, but also there's things that we can be doing now from a cultural standpoint. How do we get people to acknowledge that while we were in COVID, we weren't driving as much or we were making a concerted effort to bundle our trips together so there is an education toolkit that's part of this overall roadmap um, that will help set the city up for long-term awareness and education campaigns. And then we're also looking at those regulatory levers that the city really has a hand in pulling uh, land use code suggestions, including EV charging infrastructure, but also things like parklets um, that are becoming really uh, necessary in times of COVID, but even beyond. Uh, and then some incentives that the city can look at in the future in addition to paying their fair box for transit. Next slide. So this is just a graphical representation, but just really hitting home that we're here in 2020 today. This project's really looking out into the distance to 2050, and there's a lot of different ways to get there. And so Abby's gonna talk on the next slide about some ways that you and anyone that you know that lives and gets around in Longmont um, can help provide uh, insight into your experiences and, um, and yeah, share really your, your specific feedback about how you think that we can get where we're trying to go. Um, and obviously the toolkit will come with a lot of different variations from policy changes like I mentioned, but also indicating key partnerships that the city can continue to leverage um, and grant funding and other incentives that are coming down from the state and federal level that will help you do things like build your 20 uh, identified charging stations. Next slide. And I'm gonna turn it over to Abby and she's gonna talk a little bit about how to get involved. Thanks. All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, so um, as, as part of, of uh, engaging the community, we have a couple of options that you can do from that you can participate in from home. Um, so we have an email list um, where you can stay, so you can stay informed about the plan. Like Sarah said, the, the plan keeps shifting, but we do plan on um, circling back with folks, um, participating in key informant interviews. So we are setting up um, 30 to 60 minute interviews um, with um, key informants or, or um, community members who can kind of speak to the needs of, of themselves in their community. Um, and then probably the, the easiest um, and most direct route would be to complete the online questionnaire. Um, I think the questionnaire has been taking like less than 10 minutes. It's like 20 questions. Um, we currently have about 100 interview uh, or questionnaire participants. Um, so we're definitely hoping to learn more um, and all of, oh, thanks Sarah. So yeah, so, so Sarah put the link in the chat, I believe. Um, so for folks who are interested in providing their feedback, we do have the online questionnaire. It's available in English and Spanish. Um, Sarah, do you mind dropping the, the Spanish link as well? Um, and so, um, and, we, and we are a bilingual team as well. So if you know of folks who want to be interviewed, um, we can offer interviews in, in either Spanish or English, depending on um, the, the comfort level of whoever we're interviewing. Um, so yeah, so those are, those are sort of the key ways that folks can get involved. Does anybody have Questions? Thanks, Abby. And I know we went through it really fast. We had a little bit of time today, but we do really appreciate um, all of your time. Our contact information is on the slide on your screen right there. I'll also drop it in the chat. Um, I did include links to both versions of the survey and the way to get on our email list. So please use and abuse those and share them with all your friends and family. We really do want to hear from everybody that we can. <laughs> Thank you guys. Sarah, uh, this is Neil. Just one real quick uh, follow-up question from, from what you presented there. Thanks for the, the helpful overview. Uh, the one thing I didn't see on, uh, on the slides was um, being able to do a survey or analysis of what peer communities are doing and bringing in some of the best practices there. Um, it, it seemed like there, there's a the potential of some reinventing the wheel here and there are hundreds of communities taking a similar 
going through a similar effort, which is also very important there. I, I assume that's just part of the plan uh, that, that there will be that, that survey of, of what other communities are doing and bringing that and inviting feedback off it. But just maybe you can just comment on that just briefly. Definitely. Um, so one of the reasons why our project team was selected for this um, is because of our, our vast experience. So not only do I have a couple years working in the EV industry at Tesla, building out their supercharger network throughout Colorado and across the Midwest and West, but Brendel Group um, has been a recharge coach. They're very connected to many of the clean cities organizations throughout the state, um, as well as helped Excel put together their education toolkit. So we're really bringing a lot of our own past experience, but then we'll definitely be including um, a look at what other regions plans are, Fort Collins and Boulder being kind of your two neighboring communities already have EV readiness plans on the books. The state just issued an update to their state plan um, about a month and a half ago. And so we're definitely going to be making sure that this plan aligns with those goals. Um, and then actually we were selected for uh, the town of Estes Parks. They're going to be kind of following you and making sure that whatever they do integrates into this plan. So it's very connected. A network is really really part and parcel to making sure that EVs specifically, um, but bi bikes, buses, all of this, it's very systems focused. So we have to zoom in on Longmont and make really specific recommendations, but continuously zoom in and out to make sure that we're um, not planning in a vacuum. Thank you. Thank you. And we're happy to uh, stay on extra if anybody has any other questions that you'd like to discuss this evening. Thank you again. All right, uh, Lisa, should we go back to you? That, that's it for us. So thank you all for, for letting us jump on your agenda tonight. Uh, again, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me, or um, if you can't reach me, Neil and, and Phil and Tyler all know how to get a hold of me. So. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop off. Um, unless you guys have any any other last minute questions for me, I know you guys have some other things too. All right, thanks so much, you guys. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. All right, we'll uh, we'll jump to uh, comments from uh, uh, other board members, and uh, um, I can just call folks out there uh, just in the order they happen to randomly appear on my screen here. So uh, Jacques, we'll, we'll start with you and uh, uh, any uh, comments from your side? Sure, it'll just be brief. Um, there was a thought that kind of occurred to me as there, we were going through some of this climate change task force, and that is if we're converting buildings from natural gas to electricity, one of the benefits to that is actually with the energy assistance program. Um, the federal program right now follows the heat source. So if it has an electric heat source, that actually provides assistance to the entire electric bill. Whereas if it's natural gas, it only provides assistance to the natural gas bill. So just kind of one of those odd benefits that would happen. So that's all I got. All right, thank you. Sandy, why don't we go to you next there? Uh, and uh, any comments on your side? Um, I just, um, not so much about what we've talked about tonight, but I just want to mention that I think that the Transportation Department of City of Longmont's been really busy over the COVID time. And I wanted to thank all the staff for their hard work during this pandemic. And much of what they've done has been noted in the newspapers, so I know other people have been able to see uh, Pike Road, 9th Streets being um, widened to, from airport to, to um, um, Hover. And I checked Pike Road yesterday and saw that it's coming along, even though it's not done. But I went down the County Line Road 1 um, corridor and seeing the changes that are taking place there. So I just want to say thank you for all their hard work. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. David, why don't we go to you next there? Any uh, comments on your side? Looks like you're on mute there, David. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, I cruised Main Street a couple of times yet uh, in the last couple of days by myself and with my family and uh, just to get a look at the blocking and how the single lane was working. And I think uh, I was 
I was pleasantly surprised at how painless it was to drive through there. Uh, it seemed like the lanes were plenty wide for cars and, uh, and as well as for the pedestrian area on the other side of the walls. I think my only concern would be that, well, I, I, it'd be nice to see more patrons or uh, shops taking advantage of it. There's a lot of empty store or quiet stores with nothing going on um, in the middle of the day. And the other thing would be uh, in the uh, in this time where we're trying to do social distancing, folks that are trying to get to a front of a store that's in the middle of a block, you know, they have to pass through these areas. And um, I don't know if that may be intimidating to some folks or not, but that's just one thing that occurred to me that like walking past, let's say the pump house to get to, um, can't even think of the restaurant that's next to them, but um, that would just be one thing I would, I just wanted to bring up is I could see folks maybe being a little intimidated about walking through there to get to another place nearby. That's all I have. Great, thank you. All right, Courtney, anything on your side? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I live on Emory Street, which is two blocks east of Maine. And so having seen uh, some 18 wheelers drive by my house is pretty interesting because I think they're probably taking, you know, some of those side streets there. So on a personal note, I was like, why is a giant truck driving by my house? Um, but I did want to uh, just say thank you to the climate group. They put together a very extensive uh, list of uh, goals and hopefully we'll be able to achieve some of those. Um, so I wanted to thank them for, for all their hard work. Well said and totally agree. Um, only coming out ahead on my side, uh, I, I know Tyler, uh, uh, you and Phil are, are, are looking at uh, items for upcoming agendas and as part of uh, uh, the work plan update that I'm sure we'll be talking about uh, in, in the next month or two. Um, I don't want to lose the I'm so disjointed here with being able to have having several uh, meetings we've had to, to skip here, but I don't want to lose a topic that came up about six months ago around the, the neighborhood traffic uh, uh, mitigation program. Uh, where I think that one of the conclusions from the uh, from the TAB was to um, kind of take a fresh look at at uh, how it's structured and some of the items in the toolkit that we could consider and and just to take a step back to see if there's any um, potential for being able to uh, to improve it, make it work better for the the, the citizens of Longmont. So um, no action required now, other than uh, uh, Tyler, if you can just uh, make sure that that is included in the in the work plan for our upcoming discussions on that, that'd be great. All right, uh, Council Member Peck, uh, any comments on your side? Yep, thank you. Um, first of all, I wanna say it's great to see everybody. This uh, staying at home thing is really driving me crazy. So <laughs> it's it's lovely to see everybody's faces. Um, and I do wanna thank the uh, the task force um, I think they did an incredible job as well. Um, I, I also want to bring you up to date a little bit about RTD in that the governor, as well as senators Faith Winters and Matt Gray have been charged with having a accountability committee for RTD, looking at everything from finances to ridership to everything on how to restructure. Um, they asked for nominees and, uh, Matt Jones reached out to me and said he would love to be on that committee. So I wrote to them uh, and I agree. I would love to have Matt Jones on that committee because so far he's the only one in Boulder County that to this point that has been in the Senate and seen from the very onset what RTD is doing. So his input would be invaluable. So I nominated him via email plus uh, the chair of the Northern Area Transportation. Um, I always forget what that last A is for, but it was Alliance, so Nada. So she was also uh, nominated. So I'll try to keep you up to date on what's going on with that. So thank you. 
Wonderful, thank you. Um, all right, well, I think we have uh, some items there uh, on the radar for uh, upcoming uh, agendas. Are there any transportation related meetings on the radar um, that either Tyler, Phil, or others are aware of that want to make uh, the rest of the TAB um, keep them in the loop? I think we just wanted to let you know. I wanted to let you know in the uh, staff update just about there's a new study. There's always a new study. Um, there's a new study going on with uh, State Highway 119 first and final mile study. It's really about, it's not so much centered on kind of downtown Longmont, but it's definitely centered on kind of as 119 as the diagonal heads to Boulder. And then that whole stretch of where you have 119 as your transit corridor, but there's things that are so far away. I think we all understand that corridor that, um, you know, there's, it's really hard to get from the bus, from that corridor to actual pl places like Niwot. We always get the comment, why, why can't you bring a bus to Niwot High School? You know, and it's like, well, that's that's like three miles away from the corridor, two miles away from the corridor. So those kind of questions come up. So this is a this is a chance, and you'll. It's not necessarily a meeting that's coming up, but it's definitely a chance to uh, have some input as as the surveys start coming out and people try to do these type of meetings for outreach. So I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that that was that was coming forward. And then there was a quick question about RTD service. I think from Sandy about. Um, you know what's happened with the service and what happened was rtd basically took longmont and went to the saturday service which didn't have much impact except for the 324 bus that runs every half hour went to every hour so that's the big uh local issue everything's still free for the rider so right free longmont is still in, in place and we're not um we still have to work out with rtd how that's going to get charged as you probably heard at the last meeting where we talked with rtd but um, well, we did lose some service to Boulder. Uh, we lost the J service because it was commuter service only. We lost some of the express routes to Denver, um, but we do have we do have kind of a patchwork of we have the bolts still going back and forth on their Saturday service, which is like once an hour, I think, uh, all day. And then there's an LD3 that runs between here and Broomfield and gets us to connect to the to the spine that is. Uh, that is uh, the US 36 corridor. So we have some some options, but it's not it's not great. And we're working with RTD to bring back our services as people uh, get back to work. So that's just a quick update. Thanks. Yes, John. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you one thing. When we look at uh, this climate action task force on force on transportation and the shuttles and stuff, I just want to remind uh, Tab that. Advanced Longmont 2.0 has a transportation part of it that I and Phil have been a part of as, and been Ortiz as well. And they uh, have been working on alternative things to uh, RTD as far as shuttles, uh, et cetera. And, and I, I want them to continue to be a part of the conversation as we talk about businesses being involved in, in the solution. So. And um, for the Main Street closure, we've gotten a couple of emails about um, some people who take their elderly parents to restaurants they usually park, drop them off, walk them into the restaurant, they get back in their car and go park, and they're having a problem with the one lane being, only one lane being open. I don't know that we can solve this yet, but I just think it's something to keep in mind as we move forward. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I think that was the, uh, those were the main agenda items. Anything else pressing before we uh, sign off? All right, well, uh, 12 minutes early, we'll consider the meeting adjourned. Thanks everyone. We'll talk to you next month. Thank, Thank you all. You. Good Thank to see you. you. All right, good seeing you all. Thanks, bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.